In this review session, we wish to analyze the statically determinate floor truss shown here. This session is a part of our introductory structural analysis course available on Udemy. In addition to updated, expanded, and better organized video lectures, the Udemy course contains quizzes and other learning content. See the video description field for reference link. As you can see, the floor carries a uniformly distributed load of 3 kN per meter. We know that the truss can only carry joint loads. But here we have a distributed load. So, we need to translate the distributed load into loads that can be placed on the joints of the truss. Note that the distributed load is not directly placed on the truss. The load rests on four disjointed floor slabs each supported by two I-beams. In turn, these beams sit directly on the joints along the top cord of the truss. So, the distributed load from the floor travels through the I-beams and arrives at the truss joints as a set of concentrated loads. Let's see how this load transfer materializes. We start by distributing the floor load on each slab to the beams that support it. Each floor slab has a length of 4 meters. Since the magnitude of the distributed load is 3 kN per meter, each slab is subjected to a load of 12 kN. We can place this load at the center of the slab. If we view each slab panel as a simply supported beam, we can transfer half of the 12 kN load to either end of the panel. For panel FG, we get For GH, the load is distributed this way. The load distribution for the other two panels can be done in a similar manner. Therefore, the truss loads become. As you can see, we successfully translated the distributed load into joint loads. Now we can turn our attention to the analysis of the truss itself. For this analysis, I am going to use the method of joints. We start by calculating the support reactions. Let's draw the free body diagram for the entire truss. There are two support reactions at the pin support at A, and one support reaction at the roller support at E. So, we can easily calculate the reaction forces using the static equilibrium equations. Solving the last equation for EY, we get, EY, equals 24 kilo newtons. Now the second equation can be solved for AY. AY, equals 24 kilo newtons. And from the first equation we can see that AX is zero. Before we go any further, let's calculate the angle associated with the diagonal truss members. Tangent of this angle equals 3 over 4. So the angle is 36.87 degrees. To start calculating the member forces, we need to locate a joint with at most two unknown member forces. Keep in mind that for each truss joint we can only write two equilibrium equations. This means that we can only solve for two unknowns using the equations. So if we pick a joint with more than two unknowns, we may not be able to calculate all of them. A good starting point is joint A. Here is the free body diagram of the joint. I am showing the force in each member as a tensile force, meaning, the force arrow is pointing away from the joint. The two joint equilibrium equations are. Solving these equations for the unknown forces, we get. What is the significance of this negative sign? The sign indicates that member AF is in compression, not tension as was initially assumed. Now that we know the nature of the axial force in member AF, we can show and write the force either this way, or this way. That is, we can either flip the direction of the force arrow, and write positive 24 kilo newtons for the force magnitude. Or, we can keep the arrow in the assumed direction, but write negative 24 kilo newtons for its magnitude. Either way, we are stating that the force in member AF is compressive and has a magnitude of 24 kilo newtons. I am going to keep the direction of the arrow as was initially assumed, and write negative 24 kilo newtons for its magnitude. Now we can turn our attention to joint F, since only two of the forces that are acting at the joint remain unknown. Here is the free body diagram of the joint. The joint equilibrium equations can be written as Solving these equations for the unknown forces, we get 
Next, we can examine joint G. Here is its free body diagram. The equilibrium equations for the joint are. Hence, the unknown forces come out to be. Next, let's look at joint B. Here is its free body diagram. The equilibrium equations for the joint are. Solving these equations for the unknown forces, we get. We can continue this process until all the member forces are computed. However, in this case, given the symmetrical nature of the truss and the loads, we know that the right half of the truss carries the same member forces as the left half. What do I mean by the symmetrical nature of the truss and loads? If we draw a vertical line through the geometric center of the structure, we can see that the left side is the mirror image of the right side. This symmetry applies to both the truss members and the applied loads and reaction forces. So we can say that the force in member JE is identical to the force in member AF. This means, JE carries a compressive force of 24 kilo newtons. Similarly, member IJ carries the same force as member FG. Member, HI, carries the same force as member GH. And so on. The only remaining member with an unknown force is CH. To determine FCH, we can use the free body diagram of joint C. Since the sum of the forces in the y direction must be zero, FCH equals zero. To summarize the results, let's show the tensile members in blue, the compressive members in purple, and the zero force members in gray. And write the magnitude of each axial force next to the member.